feet get weary and so sore. But a brighter day is coming, and I'll rest on heaven's shore, and I won't have to worry anymore I won't have to worry when I reach the other shore all my troubles will be over and I'll rest forevermore my eyes will be on Jesus and my glow and I won't have to worry see my Savior standing at the door. Then I'll hear Him say, you're welcome. All your cares are left behind. And you won't have to worry anymore. All my troubles will be over And I'll rest forevermore My eyes will be on Jesus And my heart will be aglow And I won't have to worry anymore Good morning, everybody. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Acts 10.43. Acts chapter 10 and verse 43 this morning. Acts 10.43. If you're able, would you stand in honor of God's Word? Acts 10.43. To him... Give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Father, I pray you guide each of us this morning to hear your word for your glory, to be moved by the power of your Holy Spirit to obedience to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You received this morning, or should have received, uh, both a handout and a card about who's your one. This is a emphasis that we are making along with lots of other Southern Baptist churches to pick out one person who you are burdened for. And probably everybody in this room has at least one person that you're burdened for to pray for that person. And if God gives you opportunity to share the hope that's within you, your personal faith with them, and to continue to pray for them. We'll talk a little bit more about that also at the end of the message. Because one person can be the catalyst that God uses to do great and mighty things. The Apostle Peter was led to go and talk to one man, Cornelius, and also his family that he brought with him to that event. 
which began the conversion of the Gentile peoples, for most of us that's you and me, to personal faith in Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you this morning from Acts 10.43 about the salvation message. This one verse tells us some important things. First of all, the Bible says here that the salvation message is pervasive in the Bible. By that I mean it's not just something that appears in the New Testament. The Bible is always talking about what we sometimes describe as the scarlet thread of redemption from the very beginning God presents the truth that He will save men, women, boys, and girls by personal faith in Jesus Christ. From the time in Adam and Eve's fall, it is a part of the revelation history of the Bible. In Genesis 3.15, it is said that it shall bruise thy head. That is that Jesus, the, the seed of Eve, the, the seed of mankind, the perfect man, the God-man, would crush Satan's Head. That's exactly what happens in salvation. It's Job in chapter 19, 25 saying, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Now, did Job know all the details about what Jesus would do? Probably not. But he knew as a man of God and sensed that there would be a Redeemer. That, that his answer was not the only answer. That the fact that he was suffering despite the fact that he was a righteous man couldn't be the bottom line. That there was a Savior and that someday, at the latter day, in Jesus' day, he would stand upon the earth. It is Isaiah in chapter 53 verse 5 saying, With his stripes we are healed. The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. And that's important because understand again what Peter's doing. He's taking the gospel for the first time to the Gentile people. In the earlier part of this chapter, uh, Peter is given a vision of all these unclean foods coming down to him on a sheet from heaven. And he says, Lord, I've never eaten any of that stuff and I'm not going to do it. And God says, don't say what I've called clean is dirty. And it precedes his going to the Gentile people. And it's in that context that Peter realizes, wait a minute, the whole Bible is and has always been about the conversion of all men to Jesus Christ as Savior. The salvation message is not just for one people group, and it's not just a New Testament phenomenon. It is the history of all God's Word. It all points. To Jesus, And it all focuses on the name of Jesus Christ. That's the other thing, the second thing. The salvation message focuses on the name of Jesus Christ. He is the only name that there's salvation in. You and I live in a day, a, a day in which religious inclusiveness is the, the mantra of the day, in which we're told that it's closed-minded or bigoted to believe that Jesus is the only way. Why, there are millions and billions of people, maybe a billion people on earth, who believe that Buddha is the way. There are, in their context, people that believe that the philosopher Confucius can give you a lot of wisdom, and maybe they get earthly wisdom at some level from Confucius. There are maybe a, a billion people, I don't know exactly how many, who believe that the way is Muhammad, but I'm here to tell you that Buddha or Confucius won't get you into heaven, and there will be a lot of people in hell that place their faith in the name of Muhammad, but it is in the name of Jesus and His name only that we can get saved. But I want to tell you something else this morning. This will probably hit more people in our culture. You're also not going to get into heaven based on your good name. Because in the bottom line, that's what some people I believe think. They think that Buddha can't get you into heaven. They it's obvious to anybody that Muhammad isn't headed in the direction of heaven. It's a religion of hell. <clears throat> but they figure their good name will get them into heaven. They, they figure perhaps that they'll stand before God someday and having been a good, respectable, decent person in contradistinction to the other people that they see as having not been, that their good name will get them into heaven. After all, their good name has helped get them their good credit rating maybe in our day has gotten them a loan at the bank. Their good name got them a good job. Their good name did them a lot of good and they've been highly respected and they just figure that God Himself thinks that they're a super great person, moral and righteous and good. But your good name, a person's good name, will not get them in to heaven. And just to park there for a minute, when you and I go to share the gospel, 
And as you share the gospel with your one, I hope that we'll all select at least one person that we will be praying to share the gospel with, that we'll be asking God and saying, Lord, burden my heart even more for this person. You may have as, as your one this morning, someone who is... Uh, just an out there hellbound sinner, man. They're on drugs. They're just going down the wrong path. But you might have as your one this morning somebody who falls into the distinction of having a good name in this world. But they don't need their name. They need Jesus' name. It's in His name only. John fourteen six says, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Man, that's politically incorrect in 2019, isn't it? In Acts 4.12, Peter reminds us, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is only in His name. David Jeremiah, who's uh, a fellow Southern Baptist preacher, many of you know of David Jeremiah. He's popular, he's on TV a lot, but he made this statement about this topic. He said, the Word of God says narrow is the way that leads unto God. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. He quotes Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Having a broad mind could get you into the wrong place, my friend. I think that's a powerful statement. Because it is very much our day that says, be broad-minded. And that is... Uh, put forth as extolled as a virtue, broad-minded, wise people realize that there are many religions in this world and there are many people, groups that think differently than we do. And in 2019, we just can't be thinking like that. But Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. I shared with my Sunday school class, I was witnessing to a lady this last week on her doorstep or her porch, painting her porch, as I witnessed to her, she believed in God. She said that God's name was Yah, which is in the Old Testament. That's true. This lady had done a little bit of her homework, and she had some mental knowledge, but she was angry about coming to Jesus. You must come to Jesus. No religion, nobody else's name, your good name, Buddha's name, Confucius's name, nobody's name, no nothing will get you into heaven. But personal faith in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the salvation message, though, includes whoever will believe. Again, heading back to the context of our text, that is something that for Peter is a powerful thing. This is new information to him that this Gentile convert, Cornelius, can come to Jesus as Savior. Cornelius appears to have been already someone whom we describe as a God-fearer, who's someone who adopted much of the religion of Judaism without becoming a Jewish proselyte, which is a difficult thing to do and something that, frankly, a Roman soldier probably couldn't have done and remained a Roman soldier. But he's someone who already has a, a belief in God, but he wants more, and he's longing for the Lord, and the Lord leads Peter to go to him so that he would know that whoever will believe can believe. It is just believe. Calvin Miller, uh, in his book Walking with Saints, said, Innocence and trust are the virtues of childhood. These qualities combined shake hell. Could it be that simple? Could it simply be belief? Could it be that all you have to do is believe? As you share the gospel with that person or persons that God's called you to be a witness in the life of, that may be a question they come up with. Can I believe? Yeah, you can believe. I know you. You've been in church and everybody knows you're a godly person and we all like you and all this, that, and the other. But could God really love me? I've done this. I've done that. Could it be that inclusive is all that is required initially is just to believe? And the good news is, the good news of the gospel is, there is a praise God, yes, all you got to do is believe. Remember what Jesus said in John 6, 29, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Isn't that something else? Perhaps we've come to just understand that and to think about it and take it for granted. But here's what Jesus said within, again, the Jewish context. He says, here is what God wants you to do. Believe in Him. To a people group, Jesus' own people group, who were the, the, the righteous Jews, the ones that were really serious, were worried about 
tithing all their mint and cumin. <laughs> they were worried about breaking one little law in the Old Testament that would make God not like them anymore. They were just neurotic. And you can't do it. To them, Jesus says, here's the work God's really looking for. You believe in me. You trust me. And he'll take it from there. There were those who lived a pretty rough life. But like the thief on the cross in Luke 23, 42, they are willing to simply believe. I mean, that's the classic example. That's the biblical example that just sometimes pounds us in the face. The thief on the cross, by his own admission in Luke chapter 23, said to the other thief, we are here because we deserve to be. Now that's important because not everybody that will end up on a Roman cross... Uh, really deserved to be there. Obviously Jesus didn't. But lots of other people, in the, in the, by any sense of real human justice, the Romans had popped them on that cross as an example, and they didn't worry about a whole lot of jurisprudence before they did it. Not everybody on Roman crosses was all that guilty. But the thief on the cross said to the other thief on the cross, who continued to badmouth Jesus, he said, we're here because we deserve to be. But this man isn't. And then he asked Jesus this simple request. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Knowing he was about to die. And what did Jesus say? Today you'll be with me in paradise. And my brothers and sisters, for the rest of eternity, the thief on the cross will be with Jesus Christ. He's with him now. You don't want to know why? Because he lived a righteous life. No, he was a thief on the cross by his own admission there because he should be. The Romans got that one right. Because he'd been a nice person. Because deep down in his heart he always wanted to be good. Well, goodness, I don't know any of that. All I know is he was a thief getting capital punishment for what was in that time a capital crime. Now, just being a thief in our day wouldn't be, but it may well be that he was a revolutionary killer as well and that that's the context here. We don't know any of that. What we do know is this, that by simple belief, he trusted in Jesus. Amen. There will be with people with Jesus Christ who very late in their life made a profession of faith in Christ. And here's another thing I want to talk to you about sharing the gospel with your one. That's our theme. I think it's an excellent theme that we're working together with other Southern Baptists in our uh, nation to do. But here's another thing about sharing the gospel with people. You and I may not know may never know who did and didn't trust Jesus as Savior. You may share the gospel with someone and they may become a born-again Christian. This is getting uh, maybe, maybe too personal. I'm bad about that. But I witnessed to my daddy until the day he died off and on. Not always a good witness. And ever since my dad passed away, and only God can say this, I've had kind of a good feeling. Now that's a feeling. But it could be, uh, and I pray God this turns out to be the case, that when I get to heaven, I'll see my daddy there. It could be that in those last few hours from the time he had his heart attack till he left this world, that he humbled himself and got saved. Oh, I pray God that turns out to be the case. And you know that can happen for anybody we share Jesus with. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? If in sharing Christ, they simply believe even if a person doesn't have time to grow mature in Jesus when you believe you're born again Charles Hodge said righteousness is offered to everyone that believes every such believer has as valid a claim to eternal life as he would have had had he personally done all that the law demands thus broad and firm is the foundation which God has laid for the hopes of his people it is the rock of ages Jehovah our righteousness you ever thought about that? You have a claim on salvation as if you'd never sinned. You have a claim on salvation as if you'd live like Jesus because you simply believed in Him as Savior. And if this is, this is our uh, small crowd Sunday morning vacation and all that. If you're here even this morning, though this morning, and you've never believed, put your faith in Jesus, you can do it. If you're watching on TV or the Internet later, you can do that. And... This is some good news. I think more people were watching on the TV and the internet than I once thought. So praise God if you are. You can simply believe. If you haven't been in church in years, you can just believe. 
And then the Bible says that the salvation message means the remission of sins. I like that term, remission. You know, remit means, don't you? You remit payment for something. From time to time, we have people come down to the office, and we aren't able to do it a lot, but they're asking for us to help them with their light bill or help them with something like that. And uh, we've adopted a little more strict policy than we've had in the past. But if we do that, let me tell you something. If our church remit someone's light bill, or if I personally were to help someone, or you personally were to help somebody out, and you were to just pay their bill, pay their rent, pay their light bill, whatever it may be, and then the light company came back and said, well, now, wait a minute. We don't show record of that. You know what we're going to do? We're going we're to get involved at that point, aren't we? We're going to take down there our canceled check or the receipt we got, and we're going to say, I beg to differ, that bill has been paid. Let me tell you something this morning, folks. Jesus Christ remitted payment for your sins if you're a born-again Christian, and the devil ain't never taking you back. He cannot do it. You are eternally secure. Your payment has been paid. When Jesus said it is finished, it was for everyone who accept Him as Lord and Savior. He said in John 6, 37, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 1, and this is just one of many examples of this same basic statement. He says, regarding us as Christians, hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. God has sealed us in our salvation and He's given us the presence of the Holy Spirit to bear testimony that His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. Our sins have been paid for. It begins a process of life in Christ. From the time that your sins are paid for, they are paid for. And if you have the time to do it, you will grow in Jesus. The thief on the cross had little time to grow in Jesus. Other people who trust God late in life or near the time of their death have no time to grow in Jesus. But it is a remitted sin. It is paid for. It means that it is over for them. Sin is no longer boss. Lewis Berry Schaefer said of that growth process, all else in salvation is glorious addition. It is therefore written, I give unto them eternal life. Once he remits your sins, you will walk with him and you'll love him. And you'll serve him because you love him. We would hopefully be thankful to anyone who paid a major debt for us or who gave us a kidney or something. I don't know what you might be thinking of there. But how much more should we thank the one who saved us and share the good news with others? It is, I'm about to preach a little bit, and then I'm going to shut up. It is the I'm pre- a little bit of hard preaching just for a minute. Folks, it is the so- height of selfishness to keep this good news to ourselves. Right. Who is your one? Who's the one person that you could share the gospel with. And again, pray that God will open a door. They may be a tough cookie. The one I'm thinking about making my one is is kind of a tough target on our block. And it's also not saying that there's a guarantee that you'll be able to reach them for Jesus. You can't guarantee that by the best witnessing method in the world, by, by anything. You can pray hard. That person still maybe is an act of their will, stubbornly refused to come to Jesus. But you're saying, God's laid them on my heart. I'm going to focus on them for a whole year. And if God gives me the chance, I'm going to speak a word of witness at whatever level that they're open to that or that they'll allow me to do it. You can't always pigeon somebody, hold somebody in a corner, stomp on their toe and witness to them. You know what I'm saying? But you need to be praying and looking for an opportunity to share Jesus. Oh, this is the good news. This verse concludes a larger gospel message by Peter, and it precedes the conversion of many people. People hear the gospel, and they get saved, and the Spirit of God comes into their life. And Peter's life has changed as well. That's the thing. Church history has changed, and Peter's own life is changed by sharing the gospel with him. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We come now to a time of invitation. I pray, Lord, you'll convict all our hearts with the privilege of sharing good news with lost people. This salvation message, in Jesus' name, amen.